the, the title of our study is The True Church. The True Church. Now, with a title like that, of course, you're going to be thinking and, and considering, okay, where is this going to go? Because if you recall, especially some of you who came to the, to the message or to the church through something like a revelation seminar or a program like that, one of the meetings would have been the true church or the identifying marks of the true church. And generally, uh, uh, judging from the context that we're in from an Adventist perspective, usually it'll give all the criteria and reasons why uh, the Seventh-day Adventist church is the true church and, and so on and so forth. Today, we want to look at the true church from the scriptures, biblically. And we're going to deal with some assumptions that many people have, that many people operate with, not recognizing what is the true church indeed, biblically. The, the issue is, of course, uh, relevant also in the context that we have currently with all these restrictions, because one of the concerns of, of this pandemic is that, uh, you know, churches not being able to meet and people having to meet in this way on, on Zoom and so on. One of the actual concerns for many churches and church leaders is what will church attendance be like after this pandemic is over? Whatever kind of normal we return to, whatever uh, you know, situation we go back to where attendance is generally expected or you know, mingling again is expected, what will the attendance be like? And there are concerns that as a result of this, it kind of opened the door for a lot of people to be able to online easily access all kinds of different meetings that uh, there is a genuine concern that attendance will be significantly less. And what goes with attendance also impacts uh, giving or church income based on what people give or returning tithes or offering or whatever. These are some of the concerns that churches uh, and leaders have. How will they deal with the aftermath of this? Of course, uh, all of that and church attendance, all of this centers around the idea that church attendance is going to the church building, coming from the church building, who actually shows up to church. So uh, we, we want to deal with this definition uh, of church. That's the measure really of, of attendance. Now, church today, for most people, uh, how it's understood and how it's practiced really revolves around the church building where worship takes place. The church building is what most people refer to or understand when they talk about church. You see that very often because uh, one of the big debates uh, in the lockdown currently, uh, especially for uh, the U.S., is the legality and the right of closing down the church for worship. And there are some churches and some pastors who have defied the restrictions, who've said, no, 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 we're not closing our church out. This is our, our right to worship the government. Nobody has the right to stop that. And they've, they've gotten in trouble. It's been a big debate. And I know I've had this discussion with all kinds of people, uh, you know, should we obey the restriction and close the church doors and prevent uh, that from happening? Or are we obligated to God to keep the church door open and people come? And like I said, there's, there's uh, people have gotten in trouble. Churches have gotten fines. The pastors have gotten fines. People have come up with novel ideas. Drive-in church uh, is, is now an option in some places. I read about that. But all of this, all of this debate, all of this you know, agitation centers, again, around the same thing. It has to do with some kind of a building, some kind, some kind of a structure, that's the debate. The church, should we keep it open? Should we close it? People coming, people going. It revolves around this building, this idea of a building, whatever denomination, whatever group, it's, it kind of transcends that. And this is what I want to deal with a little bit today because honestly, uh, this has caused so much heartache and trouble to so many people needlessly. Where there is no real need to have so much agitation, to have so much trouble and heartache over this issue. The reason why there is trouble is because of a very basic misunderstanding, which, like I said, we'll be de dealing with. It stems and it, it arises from the definition for church. What is the definition for church? How is church defined in people's minds? And like I said, invariably, the most common, the most pervasive definition for church today among Christians and non-Christians is that it refers to a building. And, and from that uh, assumption, basically so common, so universal that it's, it's assumed, you don't stop long enough to think about it. From that, you have all these different things, the concerns for church attendance afterwards, the reaction for restrictions, whether they're going to lock down the church or not. Nobody's going to tell us we can lock God's house down. No, right, one has that right, you know, and people, all kinds of arguments and, and all kinds of debates over it. So 
people talk this way even today. You, you, you hear it in, in people's language. You immediately uh, can detect the definition that is used for church. People say, you know, I'm going to church. I came from church. Church is closed today. Well, church is back open today. We're building a new church. Every time that word church is used in these contexts, it's referring to a building. It's referring to a structure. Now, and commonly, of course, it's a building or a structure where people meet. And by extension, of course, uh, the denomination that owns or manages that building, the said building or buildings, is included in this definition of church. So this is the question here today. How do we define church? How do you define church? And I'm not asking for different opinions. More important uh, question, really, based on, on this is, how does God define church? And do we have the right definition biblically? Now, in the Bible, you'll find a very clear definition for church, one that is acknowledged and yet somehow missed. It's like it, it's acknowledged as belonging in the, in the Bible. And yes, the Bible says this, but the actual practice and the actual reality of, of how we actually utilize the, the word and the meaning of the word and how it affects our behavior seems to be markedly different to this definition that's in the scriptures. Now, I want to look at that. Now, when we, get it, uh, when we look at the scriptures, there is a particular interesting uh, rule or, or phenomena, and, and, and it, it even occurs in the world. And I'll mention it in the world before I get to the scriptures. And that's the first mention. And the first mention, what I'm dealing with here is uh, in, in court, when you have uh, trials and uh, rulings by, by the courthouses, by the judges, one very important thing is when they're dealing with an issue for the first time, uh, they are very careful in what kind of ruling they give because it sets a precedent. And you know the, 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 the law of precedent where in uh, subsequent cases that arise, many times they will refer to previous cases and especially the first one where they dealt with a similar circumstance and they will use that to help strengthen their case or their cause, whichever way they want to go. So this, this principle is, is actually present in the scriptures when you talk about things that are mentioned for the first time. It's interesting when you find a first mention in the scriptures of something, many times actually that sets kind of like a precedent or it sets like a template uh, to help us understand subsequent uh, repetitions or mentions of the same thing, whether it be a word, whether it be a topic, whether it be a subject, uh, within reason, of course. But interestingly enough, when it comes to this one, when it comes to church, we have a very unique, very clear case, a precedent that sets the default template of how everything else that follows can be understood and explained and interpreted. Now, we'll go to the New Testament. Let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 16 with this kind of introduction. Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 16, where we will find the very first mention of the word church in the Bible. It's in the New Testament because it's a Greek word. That's where it comes from. Uh, we're going to look at the equivalent word in the Old Testament or the equivalent concept at least. But this one is in Matthew 16 and verse 18. From the lips of Jesus, here is the first mention of church. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, here's an interesting uh, situation here. This is the first time that anyone mentions the word church in the New Testament. It happens to be from the lips of Jesus Christ himself. Now, the context in which he mentions this uh, about the church, the context is extremely significant. We're going to look at the context in a minute because it sets, like I said, this vital, uh, important precedent. But before we go to the context, which is very nice, very exciting. I want to explore it a little bit. I want to actually just look at the meaning of the word that is used here for church. If we look it up in the concordance, in, in the dictionary, you'll find that the Greek word here for church is ecclesia. It comes from the Greek word ecclesia. And it comes from actually two words, to call and out. So if you put it together, ecclesia or church, what our English church and how it became church, uh, the, Greek mean, the meaning of the Greek word is a calling out or an assembly or a congregation, church, that's what it means. Uh, and a called out assembly, of course, of those who are redeemed, those who belong to Christ, if you put the rest of the meanings in. But the, the word in and of itself simply refers to a gathering, a congregation, a group of people who are called out. Now, I want to add to this because someone said, oh, yeah, we all know that. Add to this, this component, that in the New Testament, ecclesia never means building or structure or house of assembly. It only always means a gathering, 
a congregation, a group of people who are called out. I'm going to see the reason for them calling out the, and the criteria for what makes up uh, the said church. But this is the meaning of the word. If you just go by meaning of words, look up meanings of words, this is it's simple. It's the, the most basic starting point of trying to understand what we're reading in the scriptures. It's not the only one, but it's a basic starting point. So that's the meaning of the word. That's as far as the word is concerned. That's why you actually find uh, its usage in the New Testament is consistent throughout. The fact that it became, uh, you know, it started referring to a building is only afterwards, well after the, the apostolic time, where they started to actually build structures for the gathering of the church. And that structure then took on some of the definition, some of the criteria of the church. And the church started becoming referring, uh, it started being referring to the structure or to the building. So that's, that's as far as the meaning of the word, like I said. So Christ here, the other component, it's very clear in this text, is that Christ is the builder of this church. Or before we get to that, I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, Christ here indicates clearly that the church belongs to him. It's his. And it's his. That's why I'm saying he builds the church. But he says uh, he builds his church. It belongs to him. I'll build my church. It belongs to Christ. It doesn't belong to anyone else. As far as the New Testament teaching on church, I'm just going by the, the scriptures plainly. He said to Peter, uh, upon this rock, I will build my church. And we're going to the building, like I said, in a minute, but it's his church. It belongs to him. He's the owner of the church, not anyone else. So it doesn't apply to a structure or to a building. It applies to people. And Christ is the builder of this church. That's why it belongs to him. These are key elements, the key components in the very first time that the word church is mentioned. And so by the rule of first mention and precedent, this will help us understand a lot of things. That actually help alleviate a lot of issues that exist today when it comes to this particular point. So it applies to people uh, who are called out. Jesus called his disciples to follow him. And he actually says, if any man will follow me, that's the invitation, the calling out. This is how Christ builds his church, his called out people. Now, we look at the obvious here, uh, context. Now, like I said, this is, this, is fairly, this is fairly obvious. Nobody will really dispute these points. Uh, and yet we find that tradition uh, has still confused this vital, simple New Testament teaching of church in our practice and in our behavior. People will not, if you share this with people, they're not gonna contest this. They're not gonna argue with you, with you about this. They'll say, yeah, that, that, that's true. And yet the practice doesn't reflect that truth. And this is where we see a little bit of a discrepancy. Now, uh, what's also obvious here is this context. I so wanna deal with this context now for a little bit because it says Christ builds his church. We've defined church. It belongs to Christ. Christ is the one who builds it. It's his doing. It applies to people, not to a building. And he says he builds it on this rock. What is this rock that he's talking about? Because if we read the verse again, he says, Thou art Peter. He's speaking to Peter. He just asked him a question. He says, Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So what is this rock that he builds his church on? Now, another key point here to keep in mind as well. Christ was talking to Peter about building the church. It was in the future tense, right? Christ didn't say, I have built my church already. He didn't say, I am building. He says, I will build, future tense. Now, keep that in mind. That's also important. But what is this rock that he builds his church on? It's actually the declaration of Peter. We see it in the previous couple of verses. Let me read those so that we can get the context and really understand this foundational point. This is simple. This is basic. But it will revolutionize and dissolve so much trouble and so, much, so many issues that exist today because of a misunderstanding of this basic definition of church from the lips of Jesus himself. So here's the context. Matthew chapter 16, the previous two verses, verse 16 and 17. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. So people who are called out, the church, that's the meaning of church, are built by Christ on and established on this rock. This rock is the truth of the sonship of the Messiah. The rock is not a literal rock, okay? So he's not talking about a literal building. The rock is the solid foundational truth 
the sonship of the Messiah to the living God is the foundation for and the faith for those who are called out that constitute the church built by Christ. We're simply looking at the passage, seeing what the words mean. This is the foundation for the church. So this is why first mention is so very, very important. Now, when we put all these things together, we see that Christ was going to build that. Uh, Christ does that on the rock that Peter declared. Now, Peter declared in answer to the question of Jesus, uh, who do people say that I am? And then he asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And this declaration of Peter had a divine source according to Christ. So it wasn't just like, Peter, you said something really nice. You know what? We're going to make that a, a key point. And he says, no, Peter, that came directly from my father. That's how important it is. It's a divine revelation. It's a divine truth. And I am going to establish my people that I will call out. I'm going to build them on this foundational rock solid truth that I am indeed the Messiah, the son of the living God. So there you have it straight away. That gives you a very easy, quick criteria to figure out the true church or the true called out people who are built by Christ. I'm not looking for buildings here, I'm not looking for, uh, for denominations. We're looking for those that are called out, established by Christ on this truth. Like I can say that makes the job easy. Kind of the process of elimination is, is speeded up when you look at the criteria from this first mention. So it's important. The next component I want to look at is a component of a transition that occurred from the Old to the New Testament that somehow is acknowledged and yet missed in practice. It's acknowledged in theory, but in practice, it is severely missed and it causes a lot of these issues today. Uh, the next verse here I'm dealing with is John chapter 4. John chapter 4 is Jesus uh, having this interview, this encounter with the woman at the well, if you remember the story. They have an interesting exchange and in this exchange, it's extremely revealing, particularly in relation to this topic that we're dealing with. So John chapter 4, we're going to begin with verse 20 and here's what it says. We'll read a few verses down to 24. The woman speaking, she says, Our father is worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I read this in its context because this is the background or this is the backdrop for this famous verse that we quote usually, uh, verse 24. God is a spirit, worshiping him in spirit and truth. That's very true. But here is the background. Here is what led up to this revelation that Jesus gave to this woman. So the woman was referring to Mount Gerizim there in, uh, in verse 20 when she talks about uh, we worshiped in this mountain, you say in Jerusalem. There was, there was this dispute, right? There was this uh, uh, tug of worship war between the Samaritans and between the Jews. Whether Samaria and Mount Gerizim was the true place of worship based on some Old Testament verses, or whether it was Jerusalem also based on some verses, this one or that one. So she perceived Jesus was, was a man of knowledge. She perceived he's a prophet. She said, well, maybe you can solve our current uh, uh, theological debate that is raging currently, which one is the right one? Which is the right place? Notice the question was a question of location. Jesus' answer eliminates the restriction of location. He actually tells her, listen, God is not bound to a place because guess what? God is a spirit. That's, that's the context of why he said to this woman, God is a spirit. And worshiping God has to do more with your condition of heart and mind in spirit and in truth, more so than what location you happen to be in. So here, Jesus was dealing with something, a transition. In the Old Testament, people understood and were told by God that he would set his name in a particular place. Of course, the place was in Jerusalem. It was different places in history, in Shiloh first, and then eventually in Jerusalem. And the requirement was, that uh, in order to worship God, you had to actually come to the place, to a specific location where God had set his name to worship God, particularly in the system that God gave to, the, to Israel, to the Jews. Uh, there were three feasts, there were seven feasts, but there were three festival feasts that were pilgrimage feasts where people were required to, you couldn't worship at home, you couldn't keep it at home. You actually had to come to the place where God had set his name, that's Jerusalem. So you had to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem three times a year because there were three feasts in order to worship God 
at that place, at that location. These three feasts were the Passover feast, Pentecost, and uh, Tabernacles. So three times a year they were, they were to do that. Uh, and of course, that's the, these festivals were a week long. So they would come and they would spend a week in Jerusalem. And that's, that's God's requirement. So the woman's question is stemming from this understanding that the Jews had. And of course, the Samaritans, who were a bit of a mix, uh, had that as well. So it's coming from that place. Jesus is indicating to her that what had occurred in the Old Testament, where God's place or God's name was in one particular location, was actually a lesson to signify a more important spiritual truth. What was represented, that was typical. The reality is that God is actually a spirit. He is not bound to a particular place or a particular location. When you understand that truth, then you can worship God at any place in spirit and in truth. So what's required is not that you be at a right place, but that you be at a right heart. Truth, spirit, and truth. This is a mindset. This is a heart condition. Now, God was teaching this lesson to Israel through these types. Because, you know, even though God had set his name in Jerusalem and the temple that belonged to God, that was not really uh, the full reality of what God intended. We're going to come to that. I'm going to deal with that a little bit. So this is the contrast here. This is the contrast and the transition from the Old Testament system, which was representative of this reality. But people had become so attached to what God gave as a representation, they thought that that was the reality. In other words, they really came to think and to reverence the temple as God's dwelling place and that you know you say a word against the temple that's it you will be killed people fail to understand the lesson now the reason why i'm emphasizing this is because the same mentality and the same childish understanding exists today to a large degree the equivalent or the counterpart for the temple of the old testament today is in a lot of people's minds the church that they belong to particularly the building and the denomination by extension, that owns and manages that building. And if you speak a word against the denomination or the church, then you are treading on dangerous ground. And you probably earn the right to be evicted from the church and from the structure. And by, by church, I mean belonging to that denomination, because this is the working definition that people use, even though the Bible gives us a very, very practical, different one. And by eviction, and some of you are actually going through this experience, I know, and, and some of you have gone, and some of you might know people who are going through, and some of you, that's coming up for you. So this is, we're all in different stages as far as this is concerned. And interestingly enough, uh, to a lot of people that, that we, you know, that you're familiar with or I'm familiar with, it actually has to do with this issue, the issue of the sonship of Christ, wonder of wonders, wonder of wonders. Anyway, uh, don't want to get distracted by that. But it, this understanding actually stems from not recognizing this transition and this exchange between the Old Testament and the New, where now in the New, the reality what was, that was represented in the Old. You see, the Old Testament was not the reality. It was a representation. It was a type. So, based on this passage, simply, location, as far as Christ is concerned, here it is from the lips of Christ himself, is no longer a requirement. It's no longer uh, a preference. You, you have no, in any spot in the earth, you don't have an advantage if you are in Jerusalem or if you are in anywhere else in the world. There is no place that has more or less of God's presence. The difference, the only criteria is if you worship God in spirit and in truth. So this is according to Jesus. Very clear. Because today we still talk about uh, the Holy Land. Uh, we should talk about it maybe as the ex-Holy Land. That's probably more biblically accurate. Because, uh, and I understand the reason, I'm not trying to knock that or, 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 or you know, uh, be insulting in any way. But the, the Holy Land stems from an understanding that at one time God honored Jerusalem and put his name there. That's the Old Testament teaching. That was representative of a greater spiritual reality. It is no longer the Holy Land. There is no Holy Land as far as uh, anywhere in the, in the earth is concerned. What makes the place holy is God's presence. If you remember when, Joseph, uh, when Moses... Uh, met with the burning bush uh, what made that place special normally it's just the side of the mountain or wherever he met it, it is there that's a normal part as any other part but when god's presence was there it made that place holy what made the land holy was god's presence now if you remember when jesus left the temple at one point he actually told the jews your house is left unto you desolate so according to jesus that that's why we uh, classified it as the ex-holy land it's no longer the holy land 
uh, that's maybe if you refer to it maybe by it's all the reference okay in that sense fair enough now i also understand that god's presence will be there again we, we're told that because when the new jerusalem comes down from heaven and lands it will land in that location and god's presence will cause that place to still be a holy place because of god's presence being there now again not my topic but uh it's just interesting and when you understand the new testament teaching it's it can save you from a lot of the distractions there's so many people today who are distracted by looking at the Holy Land, meaning Israel, what's happening in the Holy Land and the politics and the issues and, and the temple rebuilt or not and all Antichrist. And there's all this focus and fixation with the Holy Land that like the Holy Land still has some important, significant relevance in God's plan today. According to Jesus, it doesn't. Worship now is global. It's not restricted by location. And this ties in directly with our understanding and definition of church which we will see and we'll look at the, at the issues that are uh, related to that in a practical way i kind of touched on it already because uh, this this understanding of church today has caused so much heartache and misery and turmoil for so many people by how they have been treated by the church by the structure by the system that they belong to and then how they have been evicted and deprived of uh, the ability to attend and gather and go to a particular building or belong to a particular denomination. It's based, it's based on misunderstanding some of these things. Uh, and this has caused, like I said, so much heartache and so much turmoil, needlessly so, especially when it is done to those people who actually hold to the very foundation of the church that Christ came to build his church on. I'm talking about the called out people now. Because even in our language, sometimes, even now, even now, sometimes I'm saying church and I'm referring to the common way we understand church because that's how it's mostly used. That's how we, how we are familiar with it. So here Christ indicated that there is no place more holy than another. Uh, what does that mean? If you go and attend a church building or if you gather together with believers under a tree, both are equally the same as far as worship is concerned. You realize that? That's why, that's why it made me really wonder. People said, you know, no, no, we're going to keep the church doors open. Okay, if they say you can't meet in the church, no problem, you can meet under a tree. You can meet in a park. Look, we can meet this way. We're, we're gathering. Here is right now through this medium, through the technology, we are gathering as a group of believers and we're having fellowship together. That's church. That's the biblical definition of church. Thankfully, so far, no one can stop that. Maybe they might disrupt that a little bit and have some annoyances. Okay, we, we deal with that. But, but you know what I mean? So it, it's, it's amazing that people in, in wanting the, the, to defend the right to worship, what they're trying to defend is keeping a particular building or structure or a place of gathering. And inherent in this understanding is that place of gathering, that structure, that building has some kind of holiness to it because it's God's house. It's God's church. Because if you maybe pray in the, in the church, your prayer will get to heaven faster than if you pray under a tree, perhaps. Now, that sounds childish. Maybe no one will even say, say that uh, and say, yeah, no, that's true. But you know what? Some people actually believe that. Some people believe that certain structures, uh, churches, the grand churches of our day and age are the cathedrals, right? The cathedrals, the grand architecture, ac architectural buildings and structures, which are very impressive. They are understood by some people who go there that that's God's house. That if you want to pray and have your prayer really heard, you go to God's house. Guess what? This is how things were in the Old Testament. That was a picture and a representation for the reality that Jesus came to bring us. That this restriction is lifted. That this, this idea, this restriction of location, that God is in one location more or another, was simply to teach us something as an important spiritual lesson. That Jesus now is telling the woman, listen, it's neither here nor there. Let me tell you something, woman. It's spirit and truth. That is what makes all the difference. So this idea that some people have still today that there is some inherent holiness in a building uh, is not biblical as far as the New Testament is concerned. And like I said, by extension, that many times applies to the denomination. Like some of the denomination, and every person believes that their denomination is the right one. I, I'm well aware of that. It's like the, the denomination is, is, is God's agent on earth this is it and you speak against the denomination the denomination you've spoken essentially against god these, these these are all faulty traditional views that don't have support in the new testament that's why i'm saying let's 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 examine what we believe and how we practice things so we see that let me give you some examples of the new testament a few quick, quick verses here where we see time and again this particular teaching uh, in practice is carried out you see the definition of church 
being practiced. Here is a few verses I'm uh, referring to. Romans 16, 5. I'll read a few verses here uh, back to back just to illustrate how the New Testament talks about church and what it means. Romans 16, 5, Paul says, Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epinetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. Now, he's talking, he's talking about Aquila and Priscilla in the, in the context, but here he says, greet the church that is in their house. That's interesting. So the church was in their house. Was their house the church? No, the church was not their house. The church was in their house. What does that mean? The people who gathered together and worshiped God in spirit and in truth, who gathered in the house, they are the church. It's talking about people. So he says, greet them for me. It's interesting. It says, greet the church. You know, you don't greet a building, right? That's, that's so obvious. Nobody even stops to think about it. You don't go greet a building. And yet it's amazing that tradition causes us to understand the word church so vastly different to what we read in the New Testament. Here's another one. 1 Corinthians 16, 19. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Same thing again. Now here are churches that are saluting and churches who are receiving a salutation. The church is in the house. You find in the New Testament time and again that the common way that the believers uh, had church is they had home church. They gathered together in homes. They didn't build a structure. They didn't build a cathedral. They didn't build an edifice or, or a particular building. They gathered wherever they could, most commonly at home. Sometimes in the book of Acts, it even tells you they gathered by the river, under a tree, or wherever they might have gathered. Why? They understood that Jesus builds his church. His church are those who are called out, who stand on the rock solid foundation of his messiahship and his sonship to God the Father. Those are his church. And wherever they gather in spirit and in truth, that is worship to God that heaven acknowledges, that heaven recognizes. Very simple, very basic, and yet so very profound. A number of places we see that. Here's another one, Colossians chapter 4 and verse 15. Colossians chapter 4 verse 15. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea, and Nymphus, and the church which is in his house. Here is another church. It's not another building. This is another congregation, another group of believers who happen to be in this particular person's house, recognized by the apostle, who was called by God to preach the gospel to all the world, to the Gentiles specifically. So, very clear. And the, and the last one in this particular context is in Philemon chapter 1 and verse 2. Philemon chapter 1 and verse 2. And to our beloved Aphia, and Archippus, our fellow soldiers, and to the church in thy house. These brethren as well also had church in their house. So it's interesting, right now we are also doing the very same thing. We are having church in everyone's house who is tuned in today or who is connected with us today, because everybody pretty much is, is in their house. And we are having church in the house. If the Apostle Paul was writing a letter to us and you update the, the, the terminology and the understanding to technology and Zoom and whatever it is that we use, he would give a very similar greeting. If we are truly worshipers of God in spirit and in truth, built by Christ on the rock foundation that he said he would build his church on. These are the criteria. Not based on where we're gathering, what denomination we belong to, uh, what membership we might have, what building we go to. This is, not ha what uh, this is not the criteria that defines church. Just keeping it basic, simple, right there from the New Testament. I'm not... And I'm not quoting some great theologian or some great doctor said or whatever. I'm getting it from the ultimate source, Christ's teaching himself and the apostles that he commissioned and sent with his spirit. Here it is, plain and simple. That's why you'll find in the New Testament, every time the word church is used, consistently, it's always defined as referring to people, not to buildings, not to structures. Now, like I said, heaven recognizes this in a number of places, but a very uh, famous verse here, is what Jesus said. Now, before we go to what Jesus said, I recognize, I, I realize, I'm not saying some, wow, you know, profound uh, truth that nobody knows. It's, it's like anybody you talk to will say, yeah, well, we, we know that. What I'm dealing with is the discontinuity between knowing that and what in practice ends up happening that is far removed from those who profess to know that. And that, that uh, dichotomy, this, this, this conflict here, is what we're trying to resolve and ask yourself, ask myself, how do we behave? How do we practice? Do we just acknowledge truth here, you know, theoretically, yes, but the practice is, is removed or not? This is why I'm saying this. Matthew 18, verse 20, a famous verse that Jesus said, if I started off, everybody will be able to finish it off. 
for two uh, for where two or three are gathered together in my name there am i in the midst of them okay familiar with this verse what's jesus talking about here the presence of jesus in the gathering is what constitutes it a holy worship gathering that's his point here and here he's talking about not just individual worship because he talks about you know when you pray to your father in heaven go into your closet you can do that privately you can do that anywhere jesus here is talking about the collective worship and collective worship and church uh, uh, numbers here are two or more basically if you have two or more you have a gathering of believers that if it happens in christ's name Christ honors. Now, I want to emphasize something here about happening in Christ's name, because everybody uses the name of Jesus, you know, and, and they mean all kinds of things by that. If they gather in the name of Jesus, the Jesus who builds the church, and they gather in the name of Jesus with the truth that he builds his church on, that's what it means when they gather in the name of Jesus, meaning in his name, that is what Peter said, who he, who he was. When he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, that is the name of and the identity of Jesus, more than just saying, oh, in Jesus' name. What do you mean when you say in Jesus' name? You can get a heathen and teach him. You get someone who doesn't even speak English or whatever, and teach them to make certain sounds oh, in Jesus' name. That's not what it's dealing with. Because sometimes we simplify things and we smack Jesus' name uh, you know, in, in front of things we say, like some kind of a sanctifying formula. It's in Jesus' name. Now, what do we mean by that? It's the meaning behind the use of Jesus' name. Uh, in the book of Acts, you have a story of people who wanted to cast out demons in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, right? It's just, they thought in repeating the name of Jesus as a formulaic, you know, you, you say these words and, and the magic will happen. Okay, many times the name of Jesus is treated this way. So when, when Jesus say, says here, those that gather in my name, he's dealing with the meaning of it. He's not just dealing with anyone who just kind of sounds, makes that sound, whether it's in English or in Hebrew or whatever. I'm not going to get into that uh, dilemma. Uh, it's who you mean, who are you referring to? If you gather in the name of Jesus to honor and to worship and to reverence the builder of the church and his father, because we honor the son, even as we honor the father. Uh, if you do so, recognizing and understanding that you are built on that foundation, that he is the Christ, the son of the living God, that's a gathering in his name. God is the judge of the hearts. Now, I'm, not, I'm just saying biblically, this is how church is defined. This is what this gathering of worship is because that's the church in worship, two or three. Uh, God is the one who judges the hearts. So this is not a condemnation for people who believe different. Or, and I'm saying, look, all of this is, uh, is, is unacceptable to, to God and to heaven. God knows the heart. God judges the heart and how much light a person has. And God is dealing with that. He winks at the times of people's ignorance. Okay, And he also deals with people who are no longer ignorant, who are militant in rejecting the truth, like the Pharisees did as well. And they also gathered in the name of God in the temple. Their worship was not accepted. So these are things to keep in mind. Uh, we need to read the scriptures, brothers and sisters, with, with an understanding of the meaning of what the words that are used uh, are trying to convey to us. So gathering in the name of Jesus, that's what it means. It has to do with the identity of who he is. That's his sonship. That's the rock solid foundation of the church. Now, he says he will be there in such a gathering. That's why we believe when we gather today, we start praying and and. Uh, start our worship time our study time together we recognize that and we claim this promise that christ honors this gathering with his presence and it's not the presence of someone else by the way it's the presence of christ and the 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 uh, the inconvenience of us all being in different locations doesn't hinder the presence of christ from being anywhere because christ can be everywhere. He told his disciples, Lord, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Because some people say, well, this house and that house, and which one? It's, it's this presence of Christ. That's the spirit. And that's what constitutes the gathering, a holy gathering of worship to God. And like I said, we saw that kind of in the, in the burning bush when, when uh, Christ appeared to Moses there. Now, I want to come to another component here, Acts chapter 2. And we see this uh, illustrated in, in this in this story, Acts chapter 2, and many times this is used in conjunction with the idea that uh, there are certain requirements from the Old Testament, namely the feasts, that we still need to observe today. And the story of Jesus with the woman at the well is used. And this particular one here that I'm going to read in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Let's read this and just see how this plugs into our findings so far. And what we can learn from it. Acts chapter 2 verse 1 and 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. 
So here is the gathering of the disciples. The, the, point, the, the first point I want to emphasize or, or point out here is where were these people gathered, these disciples, this church? Where was it? It wasn't in the temple, was it? It says here they were all with one accord in one place. And where was this place? It was the house. The sound of a mighty rushing wind came and it filled the house where they were sitting. They were gathered together in a house, much like we are doing right now, in person though, that's the difference, okay? Just like you would gather in a, in a home church, they were gathered together, praying, having a worship season, whatever it was that was happening, and the Spirit fell upon them on the day of Pentecost. So, that's, that's just an illustration, that heaven recognized that the location did not matter anymore. God didn't say, listen, you got to be in the temple for this to happen. No, they were in the house, and God honored that. Again, simple, basic, most people are going to acknowledge that, but how do we then work with that today? It seems to have a, a marked difference or a marked change when it comes to applying some of these things. So uh, when it comes to the issue of the feast, someone will say, well, see, these, these disciples were keeping the feast. See, this is, this is something that God requires as well of us. The reason why the disciples were keeping uh, this time here, this, this feast, because this was going to be the fulfillment of it. They were keeping it as Jews would, as all the Jews were required to do. And they were still Jews. They didn't cease to be Jews. But the interesting thing is this, and this is something that people seem to, to miss. We don't have any record of any other day of Pentecost like this one that happened here in Acts 2. This is not an, a, 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 an event that kept repeating every year on the day of Pentecost. Now, what does that mean? It means simply that what happened on the day of Pentecost is permanent. The spirit that was poured out on the day of Pentecost was a fulfillment of that feast, and that did not go away after the day was finished, and then it comes again next year, same time, and then next year, same time. No, it stayed with the church continuously. God did not withdraw that spirit again. And that brought the reality and fulfillment of the day of Pentecost. Just like the sacrifice of Christ on Passover stays with us, that he fulfilled it, and stays with us permanently. So now this fulfillment stays with us permanently. So the feasts were types to show that God will do important, significant salvation events on specific times. But when that happens, that doesn't just keep happening cyclically and every uh, year it, it repeats. No, it stays there. So the reason why I'm saying this is simply that in the Old Testament, the symbolic requirement for Old Testament worship was tied to a place and a time as well. Uh, the place was Jerusalem where God would put his name. And we see in the discussion of Jesus with the woman at the well, he shows her that this was only uh, illustrative of the reality that now is. In like manner, also at the feast times, they were required to come and worship at that location. So it was a location, it was a time. So there is no restriction as far as location or time in the New Testament teaching. You don't have more of God's presence at one location and you don't have more of God's presence at a specific time. And I'm talking about the typical time. Someone will say, well, hold on, what about the Sabbath? Okay. The Sabbath was given to man before sin. It's not part of the typical system. It's not part of the, of the law that was given to Moses. It was included there, but what I mean is it didn't originate there. It was given to man in a perfect, uh, sin-free environment and a sin-free world. That's, that's as far as the Sabbath. What we're dealing with here is what God gave the Israelites in the system of types and shadows that had a temple where God's name was, and it also had worship seasons or times called feasts where they were required to assemble at the temple. Three times a year was this requirement. In the discussion with the woman at the well, Jesus was showing that these restrictions of location and time were no longer uh, in place. This transition is what a lot of people fail in taking. So this issue of the, of the, of the feast is actually uh, part of misunderstanding the New Testament teaching on the church and the New Testament teaching on worship to God, how it is carried out, and when it is carried out. There is a vast distinction between the Sabbath and the feast days. Anyway, I have a whole study on that. I'm not going to take the time to repeat it right now. But let's go to another passage here. When we talk about about this and, and bring it up to date a little bit. Uh, in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus is speaking and he uses a term, a reference that is often used today. And uh, this uh, reference is used kind of interchangeably with the word church. And this reference is the house of God. Matthew chapter 12 and verse four. Notice what Jesus says. Matthew 12 and verse four. Speaking about David, he says, how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him but only for the priests. He's, he's commenting here on, on, they were criticizing Jesus for going through the field and his disciples were, uh, you know, eating the, the corn and the, or the wheat. And uh, they were saying, this is breaking the Sabbath. This is the context here. 
and uh, he's referring to the story of David. The point that I want to emphasize simply here is that Jesus referred to the temple in the days of David as the house of God. The house of God. Remember, the New Testament church is Christ's building. He says, I will build my church. So this is the equivalent. This is many, many times uh, it's, uh, it's used interchangeably. The house of God in the Old Testament was a picture of what God would do through and in people. God illustrated it in a building made of stone to be his habitation in, in type, in symbol. He, he was there. It wasn't just, it wasn't empty. His, his glory was there, but it was restricted. Meaning, it, 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 you, if, you had to, if you wanted to see God or, or be in God's presence, you had to go there. This was an illustration of the reality that Christ would one day build the church, his church, and this church would be people, people that he would call out, people that he would transform. He would call them from darkness to his marvelous light. And the first thing in this calling is that they would be established on the truth of his sonship and his messiahship, his relationship to God the Father. And that would constitute the fulfillment and the reality of what God represented by the temple, his house in the Old Testament. So uh, today, much of the understanding of church and practice of church is drawn from the Old Testament, not taking into account this transition of the reality that we have in the New Testament. What do I mean by that? I simply mean this. Today you have uh, the practice of a system of human priests who connect people with God. You familiar with that? Well, does that, where does that come from? That comes from the Aaronic priesthood. That Aaronic priesthood sees because now we have the high priest in heaven, Christ. And yet today we have a lot of churches that have a system of priests. Now, I'm not just talking about, say, uh, you know, Catholic churches or, or Orthodox churches. They have very obviously priests and the priests are the uh, mediate, uh, mediators, uh, intermediaries between man and God. You know, if people want to come to God or ask, they go to the priest. In like manner, in our Protestant uh, you know, churches, we have the equivalent of the priests are the pastors. And in a lot of people's minds, the pastors are seen in the same light as the equivalent of the Old Testament priest, where the pastor is the one that connects the people with God. You know, you, you go to the pastor and the pastor is seen as, as the, you know, the one who's standing right there next to God. And he tells us what God says. This, this is not the New Testament teaching, even though there are pastors, but they are not the uh, the go-betweens between man and God because man through Christ can connect to God directly. So the, the work of the, pre, the, the, there's no priest now, but we're all called the kingdom of priests anyway, but the work of a pastor now is this teaching role, this guiding role. And it's not to, to, to stand as Moses did or as Aaron did and be the one who mediates and officiates between God and man. You know what? Many pastors abuse this and there are many people who abuse this in the way they treat their pastors. No wonder we have problems. I'm going to get to a few of the traditional problems that we deal with. The other issue is that's derived again from this Old Testament uh, concept of God's house being the temple is the, the belief, and I touched on that, the belief in the inherent, some kind of inherent holiness of a building. Especially so if you dedicate a building, a church. For example, if, if people buy a church or they build a church and they have what usually is, is called or referred to as a dedication service for the church, right? Do you know that there is no New Testament support for this, uh, for this practice? Think about it. Where does it come from? Uh, somebody will probably cite this, the story of Solomon when he built the temple and he dedicated the temple and he slaughtered all kinds of oxen and, and calves and, and so on. The blood was flowing and he dedicated the temple and prayed and dedicated the temple. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with praying to, to dedicate a building to God. I'm not saying that's wrong. But in it, contained in it, are inherent understandings that are problematic that end up infusing holiness and some kind of importance some kind of divine importance to this church or to this denomination that we dedicated and we prayed for and this is it and and then it becomes who comes who goes you can come you can go and this building is important look in some churches it's more obvious than others in some churches you have people who uh when they, uh, when they drive past their church, some of the Catholics, even Orthodox, uh, they are actually required to, to, to sign the sign of the cross. If you're from an Orthodox background, from a non-Adventist background, you, you know what I'm talking about. If you're driving past, past your church, you do, you do the sign of the cross. Why? So God lives there, right? And this is a holy place. You're driving past a holy place. Where does this understanding come from? Not the New Testament. 
This comes from the Old Testament. This comes from a system of types and shadows. Now, we might think this is comical. We might laugh at this. We might think, look, look how childish this is. We have a very similar, a bit more refined understanding. Maybe we just don't do the sign of the cross, but we still have some belief of some kind of inherent importance or holiness to a building or a structure, especially if we prayed for it, prayed, we dedicated it, and we, we, that's it. This is the place. And you actually see that expressed in quite a number of ways. Uh, some churches, you come into the church and they have a sign on the thing keep my Sabbath and reverence my sanctuary, right? You've seen that. I've seen that in so many churches. It's not Adventist churches now, right? I'm bringing it a bit closer to home. And, uh, and the idea is you, you need to be quiet in church and be reverent. Now, I agree with that. There's no question about that. But that is based on that uh, the, the scripture that comes from the Old Testament. It's based on what God said about his temple. And we feel and we treat the church building today as an equivalent of that. So that even when the church building is empty, guess what? People feel like there is a certain sense of awe or reverence when the church is empty. Let me tell you something. The New Testament has no support for any such teaching. The New Testament church is people. It is never buildings. And the building is no better than any other building in the street or in the, in the area. The only thing that sets it apart is when God's people, the church, happens to meet in this building and God's presence, the Christ gathering, uh, honoring the gathering with his presence, that's what constitutes it a holy gathering of worship. While the worshipers are there, when they go home and they're gone, what, you think God stays there and, and just sits there guarding the place? Or like what concept do some people have? And I, I'm saying it very bluntly, okay, so to, to cause us to think. In some churches, that's actually the teaching. The, the, the front area is the altar, the holy place where God is. God is in a box up the top there, and this is where God lives. And this is why people treat the church building and therefore the denomination and the structure as something that is divine and holy. And we have a form of this that has been inherited and has been modified where we now treat the denomination and the buildings as having some kind of inherent importance. And who controls, who comes and goes, has the power of heaven, essentially, has the power to save or to condemn. Look, it's so tragic because some people actually think that when someone is, is evicted from the church or, or this fellowship, they essentially see them as having lost salvation. When they are deprived of attending a church building and, and the membership is gone, uh, they see them as having lost salvation. All of these false teachings stem from a lack of recognition of what God intended in the Old Testament and the reality that we have in the New Testament. Here's another one that uh, I want to mention since we're here. Uh, this, this particular point, when it comes to the Sabbath, uh, this is, I'm, just, I'm just challenging and, and questioning traditional practices and understandings that we have that that we inherit from one generation to the next that we don't stop long enough to question well the one I'm, I'm, i want to deal with quickly here is the sabbath worship hour or the divine hour uh, you know what i'm talking about the divine service as soon as i say that you should know that i'm referring to a particular time of the sabbath 11 o'clock divine hour right and uh, i <laughs> look i'm a speaker right it's amazing how people with through this tradition it's like the 11 o'clock hour is the most important hour of the sabbath hours it's like the extra special divinely blessed one and and you put you know this speaker here and if if a speaker gets the 11 o'clock oh yeah you know this is a sign of respect and honor to the speaker. if the speaker gets the say nine o'clock or or the afternoon oh he's he's a bit lower on this Listen, I'm a speaker. I, 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 do, I deal with camps, with organizing, with people being placed. This is a belief that exists. I'm not making stuff up. I'm telling you. Where does this come from? This is, this is laughable if it wasn't so tragically real, brothers and sisters. There, there is nothing more important about 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock or, or any o'clock of Sabbath. It's the Sabbath hour. Now, I understand. It might be because at that time, uh, the person is preaching and he's breaking the bread of life, what we call breaking the bread, opening the word and teaching. And so it's a worship se session, different to say the, the time when you're not doing that on Sabbath uh, actively in a group. Okay, so that makes it special. But it's no more special if you do it at 12, at 1, at 2, at 5 a.m. If you do it at whatever time during the worship season or during the worship time, it's no more special. Anyway, it's just, and 11 o'clock has this, this, uh, this aura around it, even at camps, even at events that are not just a regular church service and speakers, it's like, you don't, who's, who are you going to put where and who's at 11? Oh, no, no, you better put this one at 11 because, it, and it's all stemming from 11 o'clock is important. Traditional practices and behaviors that we have adopted, we inherit. Somehow they come to us, they land on our, on our heads somehow. We've learned them, we've, we've been taught them, whatever it is. And we, we carry them out like they are normal. 
and nobody stops long enough to question them. And they are markedly in contradiction with plain New Testament teaching. That's, what, that's why we're looking at definitions, brothers and sisters, keeping it simple. Okay, let's go to Hebrews. Said my piece on that. I think you, you see the point. These different traditional practices, where do they come from? Are we misunderstanding something? Hebrews chapter 3. Let's go to the New Testament here again and see what we can learn. Uh, what Jesus talks about, and maybe we'll, we'll conclude with this because I've, I've taken my time here. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Here is what we are told. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we? If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto, excuse me, unto the end. Beautiful verse. What's this talking about? The same thing. Here is the author of Hebrews recognizing that. He's saying Christ has more honor than Moses. And in the context you'll find Moses was a servant. You know, uh, he was faithful in the house as a servant. But Christ as a son over his own house. And then here's the definition very clear. The house of Christ. That's the church. That's what we're talking about. That's the temple, the equivalent of the temple in the Old Testament, what the temple represented. This is the house of Christ, his own house. And then he says who this is. Whose house are we? We are the house. We are the building of God. We are the lively stones. We are the temple of the spirit. This is the New Testament teaching, brothers and sisters. And, and while this is acknowledged, like I said, the, the retention of the, some of these uh, relics of Old Testament understanding that we carry through to today have caused so much heartache, so much grief, and so much confusion among so many people and so much alienation and so much misplaced loyalty. There are people who are loyal to the denomination, loyal to the structure. And by structure, I mean whoever controls the buildings. They see that's the church that, and loyalty to that. That's the same problem that the Jews had. And we miss the point that Christ's church, his own house here, are we, those who are built on the rock, the foundation that he told Peter. That is the teaching of the New Testament. Plain, simple, easy. You don't need a doctor's degree to figure it out. You don't need some theologian to give you a, a long lecture or, or a, write a book or a series of DVDs. It's not that complicated. You don't need to read books and books and books about it. Here it is, plain and simple from the New Testament. We are the house of God. Now, the point I just want to close here, and, and we started with this, and I'll close with this, and this will kind of package it nicely, is that here it says in verse 6, Christ is a son, as a son over his own house. This is what sets Christ apart from Moses. Moses is a servant. Christ is worthy of more honor and glory than Moses because he is a son. Now, here's the key. Christ did not do anything to, honor, to, to, to cause him to have more honor than Moses. It's not because he accomplished anything. It's not because he did anything. The reason why he has more honor than Moses is because of his relation to his father. Don't miss this point. That's the sonship of Christ. It's not an accomplishment. It's not a, a graduation. It's not an, a, an upgrade that he got because he did something better than Moses. It's who he is. That's what sets him apart from angels in the beginning of Hebrews and Moses in this particular context. He is a son over his own house. Here's the question. The two go together. The, the two go hand in hand. He is a son over his own house. If his own house, he is not a son over, of, of those who are of his own house or those who are of his church. Let me translate. If the church does not see Christ as a true, real son over the church, then is it really his church? That's a question to really consider. Is it really built by him? If it fails to recognize or if it outright denies the rock on which he establishes the church, are they then really standing and built by him and standing on the rock? The answer is pretty obvious. So he is a son over his own house. Whose house are we? That sonship is real. It's just as real as the fact that Moses was a servant. What, if, if it was only a metaphor, like some people say, if it was only representative, if it was only spiritual, then you have a very, very serious problem. Christ does not build his church on a metaphor. Christ does not build his church on some spiritual, uh, non-real truth. It's a real, solid truth. It's just as real as the church he built. So the two go hand in hand. You can't separate the two. And like we saw that in the precedent where Christ first time mentioned the church in the New Testament and what he will do. And here we see it again very clearly in the book of Hebrews. So uh, the sonship and the reality of the sonship and the link between the two is vital, cannot uh, be ignored. That's why the Bible talks about the lively stones that are built. Uh, no, no foundation can any other man lay than that which is laid. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. What is it about Jesus Christ himself? the son of god it's a real foundation 
it's a real rock. It's not make believe. It's not. Uh, it's not a metaphor. The truth of it is not a metaphor. The the usage of Christ uh, of the word rock. That's that's a metaphorical rock. There isn't a real literal rock, but it represents a solid, foundational, immovable, indestructible truth. That truth is not a metaphor. That truth is the sonship of Christ. I hope that makes sense. So. Uh, Time and again, like I said, you see that uh, the church in the New Testament is referred to as the body of Christ. It's a body with many members. A body is living. And this is the point. I just want to close with this to, to like I said, br bring it all home. I've had a few verses, but I don't want to take too much time. The New Testament teaching about the church is referred to as a body. A body, brothers and sisters, is a living organism. That's the key feature of a body. It's not a dead body. It's not a corpse. When it talks about the New Testament church, it's a body. It's not a corpse. A body is a living body, a living organism. The life of that organism is the sun. The Bible says, he that has the sun has life. That is the life of the church. That's what gives entrance into the church. That's church membership. What Jesus said to Nicodemus is church membership. You must be born of the water and of the spirit. That spirit is his very own life. That's what gives us membership and entrance into the church. And that's what retains our membership in that church. Praise God. And no man can remove it. And forget about names on books on earth. Okay. That is so irrelevant. That is so irrelevant to the plan of salvation. When some human or some group of humans on earth think they have the power that by removing your name from some book on, on earth, that they have therefore removed your name from the books in heaven. That's what a lot of people believe. That is not biblical. Your name as a believer in Christ is written in the Lamb's book of life. No man, no human has access to that book to take names in and out as they please. Praise God for that. Only God has access to that. So if you've gone through a trial with the church, if you've been cast out, if you've been mistreated, you've been traumatized, I want to encourage you. Remember, the New Testament teaching, what Jesus taught us is plain and simple. No man can pluck you out of his hand. If you are cast out, especially for standing for the truth of the Sonship of Christ, rejoice and be Sorry, rejoice and be exceeding glad. They've done that to others before. They, no one, the enemy cannot touch the, our belonging to Christ. If we are members in his body by receiving his life. He that has the son has life. Again, there is that link again. The sonship is related to life. The sonship is related to the church. The church is made up of those who receive the life of the son. That's how he builds his church. That's the New Testament teaching, plain and simple. So with that in mind, I want to leave it there. Because when two or three are gathered, just like we are gathered here today or, or any, in any time at any place, so long as they are built by Christ, they have the life of Christ, that constitutes the church of Christ. Don't get distracted by the misunderstandings that exist, the traditions that exist, that, that come in and cause distress, that cause agitation, that cause debate. And people get so caught up about the church building, whether it's open or closed. Once you understand the New Testament teaching, you start seeing things in their true light. Don't get distracted by side issues that only cause and foment dissent, dispute, alienation when they are not the real issue. The real issue, the real question that matters at the end of the day, ultimately, is this. Do you have the son or not? Do you have his life or not? That is the only constituent of the church that he builds, if you have his life. There are other aspects sub in, in subcategories to that when I say only constituent that doesn't mean that's it and there's no other teaching there are subcategories of the teachings of the of the founder of the church Christ and all the things he taught his disciples but at the outset at the foundation the the, the entrance the key is the sonship of Christ and having his life that's the church that's the new testament teaching let's close with a word of prayer and then we can have some question and some discussion time father in heaven thank you so much that your word is clear that your son and his teaching is so easy to perceive. But we also know, Lord, that it's not easy to perceive by human wisdom and intellect, but it's because you give your spirit that we might understand spiritual things. Father, I pray you'll save us and help us to navigate the issues that distract and cause so much turmoil in the world today. Issues even relating to the church. Issues that cause pain and heartache to those who have been mistreated by the church for whatever reason, but especially if it's for the reason of standing for the truth of your son. I pray that you will encourage such a one. I know some listening uh, today might be in this particular experience. Maybe they've passed through it. Maybe they're passing through it now or will in the near future. I pray that you will encourage and uplift such a one with your spirit and help us all to look up and to see and know that we, as called by Christ to stand on his truth, 
are the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. Help us to keep our eyes focused on that, not to be distracted by anything else. I pray and I thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray you were blessed by this video. Be sure to subscribe to our channel, like, turn notifications on, and most importantly, share this video with others. May God the Father richly bless you in Jesus.